Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're really pleased to have uh, the, the, the next one of our Dean's Invited Lecture Series here. Um, today we have Breton Saha from Amazon, AWS. Um, this series really is intended to emphasize the opportunities for c connections between the School of Engineering and Yale and industry. And our conversations today with Breton have really uh, driven home that point. We've been jumping from topic to topic, uh, all kinds of different ways that what's going on at the university uh, interrelates and can impact what's going on at Amazon and certainly vice versa. Um, part of the infrastructure that Breton has been responsible for developing at Amazon is really the backbone that will power the transformative tools uh, that we're witnessing in industry right now with generative AI. Um, this is a massively computationally rich area, but also a massively computationally expensive and data-driven area. So um, what I hope we'll learn today is sort of ways that he sees a future interaction between Yale and Amazon uh, being productive and profitable um, for all of us. So with that, I would love to welcome, so I will say, Breton was, I think, Zhang Xiao's first PhD student, yeah. is that correct? Yeah. So Zhang was the uh, chair of computer science, certainly, you know, the whole time I've been here until this year. Um, and uh, it's really wonderful to see uh, these you know, birds that have taken flight come back home to, to roost and, <laughs> and share, share their experiences with us. So he's going to give an introduction and tell us a little bit about his trajectory, and then he and I will have a brief chat, and then you guys can ask him some questions. Okay, so with that, take it away. Thank you, Dean Brock. Thank you. It's nice to be back home. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time, a lot of days and nights at the A.K. Watson, in the zoo and other places. And it was really nice to see how the university has uh, evolved over the last many years, thanks to leadership from you know, Dean Brock, the Yale leadership, Jean himself, uh, and seeing the amount of investments that are being made in computer science and engineering. So what I want to talk about today is some ways in which we have been using generative AI and enabling customers in the enterprise to use generative AI. Today, most of the machine learning, vast majority of machine learning and AI in the world happens on AWS, happens on the infrastructure that my team builds. And what I wanted to talk about and where I'm hoping you can get um, some insights on is where the industry is going um, and what would be the research problems that would be interesting, especially from an industry perspective, where the science is uh, in terms of where we can take it out to customers and where the science isn't in terms of where I think there's a lot of fundamental research to be done in a university like Yale. So let me get started. Um, so there really have been you know, a set of tipping points around generative AI. Um, one of them has been just the astonishing increase in the amount of compute capability. If you think about IT, if you think about computer science, it was driven by Moore's law. And Moore's law said that the amount of compute is going to double every 18 months. What we have seen in AI and machine learning for the last 10 years is that compute capacity has been doubling every three and a half months. We are going at six times, literally six times, the speed of Moore's law. We are going literally at six times the speed at which IT used to go, and IT evolved really, really fast. Even if you look at the last five years, that's about 30 years of progress in IT land. And now you go back 30 years, there was no Amazon, no Google, no Facebook, no Meta, no Twitter, and so on. So this field is moving extremely fast. The other thing that has happened is the emergence of internet scale data. And I'll give you a little bit of insight into what that is doing uh, with large language models. And then the third thing that has happened is the amount of machine learning innovation. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about this. But the other thing that has also happened that I think is really interesting for Yale as a university for students and faculty here is the role of the cloud. Because what we have done is we have made it possible to make this compute and this data readily available to anybody that wants to use it at a very, very cheap cost. 
So what has this meant for innovation? If you think about machine learning, the capacity of machine learning models, and you, know, you can measure it by the number of parameters, just in the last three years has grown by 1600x. This is super, super, super exponential. Okay, and that is what is driving amazing innovations. Now, what does that mean from a data perspective? If you think about we humans, in the course of a lifetime, an average human will probably listen to about a billion words or two billion words. When we train these foundation models, we train them on trillions of words. So each one of these foundation models is being trained thousands of times, thousands of times of data that an average human will be consuming in their lifetime. You know, if, you, if I give you another perspective on this, all of Wikipedia is about 18 gigabytes, 18 to 20 gigabytes. When we train these models, we train them on trillions, on terabytes of data. And that means that you're putting in the knowledge of thousands of Wikipedias into one of these models. And that is what is triggering this amazing innovation that is coming on in generative AI. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of research to be done in terms of making it really deployable at scale in the industry. And some of that is what I'm going to talk about. So this innovation can transform industries. It will transform industries. And I'll give you a little bit of sense of some of the places where we are doing this. So let me start with um, Amazon Code Whisperer. This is a software development tool that is based on generative AI. Okay? We have seen a lot of companies now start using this tool. So let me actually show you how this works. So all you are doing is, as a programmer, you are just writing comments. You are just putting in English language text. So the programmer came in and said, you know, just write me a, write me a program to upload a file from S3, okay, using server-side encryption. Then Code Whisperer is actually it takes this comment, and then Code Whisperer is just going to come in and generate this file by itself. This is all automatically generated. As a programmer, you just have to write this English stuff. Okay, and then Code Whisperer will give you a few um, hints about it. And then you come in, and this is another Java thing, and all you're doing is, you know, you're writing this, it went too fast. It said create some stuff, and Code Whisperer is going to basically create the entire function for you. Okay, and what we have seen, So, you know, this is what that programmer writes. Create a function to do this. And it will generate the entire function for you. OK, and then you can go in and run some checks and so on and so forth. So what does that mean? What does this mean for um, the software development industry? And what does it mean for, um, what does it mean for a university? like Yale. We have studies that show people that are using Code Whisperer-like tools are about 50% more productive than people who don't, because you're not doing your own coding. But there's something more profound going on. And these tools, by the way, are going to keep getting better every year. So imagine five years from now, when these tools are really good. What is going on is something very profound here. It's that Java and Python and Rust are no longer the programming languages. English is the new programming language. And you can imagine that we are going to be able to do this with, say, Italian or Chinese or Hindi or something. And so our mother tongues become the new programming language. What does this mean for Yale? How should computer science teaching evolve 
to address this. In our talking, in fact, this morning with Dean Brock about how do you bring more liberal arts education to STEM, to computer science and engineering, but this may basically mean that anyone who is an English major or history major or whatever is now going to become a software developer five years, 10 years from now. And so when you have democratized this to some extent, what does it mean for innovation in the world when every person is a software developer? And these are, I think, things that you know, university like Yale should think about because it's really kind of a university that's at the forefront of how does technology impact society five to 10 years from now and how do we educate people in that way? The next one um, I'll talk about is what's happening in medicine. So there is a lot of work we are doing in my team and elsewhere in terms of applying AI to medicine. And the reason that is happening is you can see, just like with Moore's law, the cost of sequencing, and this, the cost of sequencing a human genome is dropping in a very fundamental way. It used to be a huge amount, you know, few million, hundreds of millions, 20 years back, to now it's about $200. And because this cost has dropped so dramatically, you can now spur an entire industry that's based on this. In fact, so we have this um, challenges, you know, in terms of being able to do genomic sequencing. And as a result of that, um, I was actually talking to some yesterday, um, yesterday at dinner, who is at Columbia University, and they were actually talking about, hey, we also want, and I'm sure the same thing is true here in the School of Medicine or even in, you know, in the engineering departments that are trying to do some AI in medicine, that you have a lot of infrastructure issues you have to deal with if you want to do that kind of genomic sequencing. Okay, that is why we, I would, you know, we came out with this service that is actually being used by a lot of universities and public health departments now to be able to do uh, gene sequencing and precision medicine. And in fact, you know, the, uh, the Department of Public Health in Chicago, they were able to use these tools to run some analysis. And they found that when you go like 10 miles from downtown Chicago, your life expectancy falls by like eight or 10 or 12 years. And the reason that happens is because of difference in access to specific kinds of care. And they were able to do that because they were able to use these tools to see what kind of medical care isn't being afforded there. And they have now changed the way that medical care is being given. You know, similarly, Genomics England, you know, they have a huge database of probably the world's largest of humans who have genetic mutations uh, with some rare diseases. And they're now using these tools to do a lot of precision medicine. And I do think that medicine is a domain that is ripe for a lot of innovation from computer science, from AI, and a lot of other fields. I'll give you another example of the kind of innovation that we can do about. So patients today are walking with tons of data. You know, you have all of your um, wearables and you know, you're getting all kinds of data from um, multiple different data sources. But the thing is 97% of this data is not being analyzed, is not being used. And so imagine the quality of patient outcomes that we could improve if there was a way for us to be able to analyze this data. Okay, and this being able to analyze this data, I think, is another really interesting research that I think a university like Yale would be perfectly suited for because you have a school of medicine that's a leader, you have the engineering parts that's a leader, you have the data science parts that's a leader, and so this kind of interdisciplinary work would just be amazing in terms of improving patient outcomes. Now, there's one way in which we are doing this, which is clinical documentation. So today, when you go to a physician, um, because of electronic health records, that interaction that you're having with the physician needs to be scribed. And so the physicians are actually doing it and then creating a summary and then they're uploading it to your electronic health records. 
It turns out physicians in the US on average spend about 40% of the time doing this scribing. And that is the time that is not being spent on patient care. That's the time that is really an unproductive use of the physician's time. And so what we have done, and we have launched this product a little bit, is using generative AI to automatically generate these patient physician uh, summaries. So as you're talking to a physician, that particular conversation is getting captured. It's automatically getting transcribed. A generative AI model is automatically generating the summary. Now, the key innovation that we did here that I think is very relevant also from a research point of view is, as you know, generative AI can also have hallucinations. So you need to have a very high degree of accuracy. And so one of the things that we did here, which I think was a pretty nice piece of innovation, but there's a lot more research to be done, is what's called the concept of grounding. So we have the original transcript, we create a summary, but every part of that summary, we put a link to the original source that says, here is why I created the summary. Okay, and that is what helps make this um, deployable to enterprises. This is supposed to reduce the scribing time by 70%. We are partnering with 3M, who have 300,000 physicians across the US. Now imagine reducing the time or making them more productive by 70% for 300,000 physicians in the US. In fact, I was looking at all of the places that this will go into POC, and I was really glad to know that Yale New Haven Hospital is actually one of them. Okay. And the reason I go into this example is to say that you may be looking at a lot of generative AI. Some of it may seem to be hype but a lot of it is actually being put into real production at scale deployment. And so all of the research that you can do in terms of making it accurate, in terms of reducing hallucinations, in terms of finding ways to do the grounding actually helps in these situations. So here is how it actually works. I already talked about this. So, you know, the patient says, um, this one is not showing. You can see the highlighted parts. The patient says, you know, this is what is going on, and we take the whole summary, and then we create it. And you're not seeing it here, but we'll actually have links. We'll actually have references from here that says this part came from here, this part came from here. Okay, and all of this is being automatically generated. So what do you need to do generative AI in the enterprise? The first one is you really want to have an easy way of building with foundation models. And you want to have a choice of building with foundation models. And the second is then infrastructure. And that, in both of these, there's a lot of research to be done, especially in the second one. And I'll talk a little bit on that. So the first one was the kind of uh, models that you can use, you know, you could use Bedrock, there's a bunch of other stuff to use. And I think the key thing that comes out from a research perspective is that it's very likely that one model isn't going to rule them all. And so there is a need for figuring out what kinds of models work well in what situations, and the thing that I think will really distinguish going forward is not just the models, but the data that is being used to train them. And in fact, that's where, you know, to Dean Brock, which is, can Yale play a role given the amount of data you have across the university, not just in the engineering, in the social sciences, in all of the libraries, in all of this, is there a role that Yale can play in making that data available as training data, because that would be huge. And would not, that would not just be huge from a research perspective in moving frontiers, but I think that would be a huge source of monetization as well, if Yale could figure out how to do that. So the first thing in here is um, the set of models, and you know we have uh, some of the most state-of-the-art models that you can play with. Uh, and then there are a lot more models that are available on SageMaker Jumpstart. Now, foundation models can do a lot of natural language interaction with you. 
But foundation models cannot execute tasks yet on your behalf. So for example, let's say you said, you know, give me all of the options for having a plane ride to Florida over Thanksgiving. You know, today they are probably going to give you all of those options, but then you would say, and by the way, go make the bookings for me. So that action part is still not there. And that is why we actually augmented bedrock with what we call agents, where agents can take actions on your behalf. Now, there's a lot of research going on. How do you make it safe? How do you make it secure? Um, so, you know, it works in a particular constrained set of uh, environments, constrained set of actions. And so there's a lot of research to be done here, but you can clearly see that is where the world is headed. You can clearly see that you're going to be having some kind of a personal assistant and say, hey, um, I need these to be bought. Go get this from the web. And so this notion of having actions and assistance, all of this is coming. And so there's a lot of really interesting research to be done in terms of how do you secure it, how do you ensure privacy of the data, how do you ensure that the actions being taken are uh, well-meaning and so on and so forth. Okay, next let me start a little bit around uh, the infrastructure. Most of this is on GPUs. Um, and of course we have our own uh, custom silicon as well that's purpose-built for, that's purpose-built for, um, for uh, generative AI, and there's just a ton of work to be done. There's a ton of systems research to be done in making this more efficient. Even now, customers spend a lot of, even now there's a lot of investment to be done in training these models, and at every layer, at the hardware layer, at the system software layer, at the tooling layer, there's a ton of innovation to be done in terms of figuring out how we make this a lot more efficient. And you know, we have some ideas, but if people are looking for interesting research ideas, this is where um, there's a lot of work to be done. And then there is tooling. What happens, and again, there's a lot of HPC-related stuff that you can do here. The thing that's different about generative AI especially is the scale of compute. And so as you're training, let's say, these foundation models, you're probably training them on thousands of GPUs or other accelerators, maybe for months at end. And so what do you, then used to happen before was what about the resiliency of the accelerator? What if one of the accelerators for some reason has an error? How do you recover from it? Because you don't want to waste months of work. And so that is where things like self-healing systems that we have, but you, know, you can obviously do more there, and other kinds of optimizations become really important. And so for those of you working on kind of the system software side, this is really fertile territory for the kind of innovations that you can do in terms of having real impact. The other thing that's happening is the emergence of no-code tools. There's you know, no-code software, and this is all about democratizing and making software development accessible to a lot more people. So there's no-code software tools, and then there's no code machine learning tools. And you know, I mentioned before that generative AI is going to democratize software development, like English will be the new programming language. These no code tools are also about how do I do point and click to get my job done. Okay. And this is yet another trend. Um, when you think about product development, Having these aesthetics, aesthetics right, how do you make something really simple to use? How do you make something really easy to use? Is not just about science education. It also needs a lot of you know, broad liberal arts kind of an education. So you really understand from a product, you can think about a product not just from the engineering point of view, but also from the usability point of view. How will users interact with it? And I think that is one of the things, again, that a university like Yale with its rich liberal arts tradition can do a really good job of how do you train engineers who not only know how to build a product, but who can actually build a product that's delightful to use. And delightful to use for a lot of other people. When you're talking about how do I 
develop a software tool that someone who doesn't know anything about software uses it. Okay, and there's a lot of work that has to go into designing that stuff. So this is going to be another trend um, that is important. The reason I, talk, I wanted to talk about Amazon Monitron um, is to show how there can be synergies with what is already available and how Yale can play into that. Uh, because you know there are some strengths we bring at AWS, but there are some strengths where we are just not in the domain that Yale can bring. So what Monitron does is it, reduce, is it uses machine learning for doing predictive maintenance of your machines. Like it predicts when your machine may go down. Okay? And the way it does that is we have these sensors. And these sensors are monitoring your equipment for temperature and vibrations. Okay? And so if you think of a machine, when the machine is about to break, it kind of sounds a little weird or it vibrates a little weird. It can get heated up and so on and so forth. So these sensors are put on devices, put on machines, and then they monitor the temperature and vibrations of these devices. And then what we use is, you'll see these in these kinds of things. These machines are installed, these sensors are installed in these kinds of machines. And then they're streaming it to the cloud. And in the cloud, we detect anomalies. And based on those anomalies, we predict when something is going to break. And so there are a lot of companies, this is Baxter, uh, but you know, Baxter, SKF, and a bunch of other companies, Coke, um, that are actually using these for predicting when their equipment will fail. Now here's something interesting. I was actually talking about this. Uh, as I mentioned, I was talking to some people from the Yale School of Medicine yesterday. And they said, well, do you have anomaly detection that we could use to predict strokes? Now you can imagine this, these sensors are actually sending data to the cloud that is a time series data where we are predicting anomalies. Now you can use those predicting anomalies in our case to detect when a machine is going to break, but you can imagine you can do this for other kinds of time series data as well, one of which could be health data. Now where does, where could AWS and Yale play really well with each other? If you have to do this research, if you have to do this work and if you have to do this research, you need an infrastructure that will be able to take data from millions and billions of people, be scalable, be robust and efficient, and not and do all of that anomaly detection. We have that infrastructure here. What someone else could do is say, look, here is the domain expertise. Here is what the data looks like in a normal person. Here is where the anomalies come in when someone is going to fall sick. So you could then marry that domain expertise with our infrastructure, and then together, we could build some really interesting things. And by the way, I was talking to people, and this is probably applicable even to the School of Engineering, is you could do, we have similar things for image processing, so you can imagine that you could have radiology images being uploaded and detect anomalies. Now, there's two aspects to that. You have to build the infrastructure which we have, and then someone has to do the research that sits on top, and then together you end up with some remarkable systems. The other thing that you know, is coming across a lot is uh, sustainable mobility. So if you look at the automotive industry, that's really thinking about electrification, about uh, you know, getting greener, using batteries. And so one of the things that's happening now a lot is using geospatial data uh, to figure out driving habits and optimizing things. So BMW has been working with us, you know, and they do things like predicting the impact of traffic, where do you put charging stations, and a lot of other stuff. So, you know, all kinds of data analysis going on, but this is yet another modality to the data, which is geospatial, and how do I use it for predicting user behavior. And so, you know, they're basically looking at this for predicting affinity for electric vehicles, you know, depending on uh, driving tendencies and where people do their drivings.
Okay. Um, this, I talked about all of the applications. You know, first about the rapid rate at which science is going, then about all of the applications, then where there are still research problems in doing that. And then the fourth, this one, is yet another place where there's a lot of research to be done, but a lot of interdisciplinary research to be done, which again, knowing the heritage of Yale, is a great place for Yale to be in. Because, you know, AI is going to, you know, the spending on AI is going to just go astronomical. I mean, you can look at all kinds of um, estimates. Those estimates are always hundreds of billions or trillions. So it's going to be a pretty large industry. But there's also a need to be able to use it responsibly, to be able to put in the right amount of guardrails in it. And that is what is not just a computer science problem. That's a computer science with public policy, with, you know, there are legal implications of it. And so that is a holistic thing. And I think that is where, again, you know, universities can play a big role, especially in bringing interdisciplinary work. There's just a ton of research that can be done here um, in terms of this is the core computer science part of it in terms of fairness, you know, bias detection, toxicity, and so on. In terms of explainability, why is the model behaving the way it is behaving? In terms of robustness, you know, how do you make it safer from all kinds of injection attacks and so on and so forth? In terms of privacy, governance, and so on. So, especially with generative AI, especially with large language models, there's a lot of work to be done in this. But there's also a lot of work uh, so, you know, we do this, and if you want to get a sense of what is response, what is useful to industry, take a look at these, some of these service cards, because they talk about how customers approach this problem and how customers would like to get insights into these problems. But it's just not there, because, you know, there's a lot of work on regulatory agencies now. There's a regulation called ISO 42001 that is you know, making its way through in terms of how you regulate uh, or how you uh, work on AI and ML. And that's all great place for a lot of interdisciplinary work to be done that's going to have a huge impact on how we deal with um, AI and ML. Finally, I want to uh, talk about a couple of things that we do. Uh, in my team, we also run the Amazon Research Awards. Um, and you know, we have awarded over $35 million in support of research. Um, and in the last, what, eight years, we have funded more than 220 universities in about 40 countries. So, you know, it's a pretty global spread. It's actually uh, funding that we also do to Yale. So I know that um, at this point, we have actually two, two uh, grants going on, one uh, you know, one with, I think, in the genomics department, and the lower one is probably in the computer science department. Um, but, you know, this is, happens every year. So if people have good ideas, submit to these. And in addition, because this is getting so interesting, we're also investing $100 million in helping customers take generative AI projects from concepts to production. And so these are all really good areas to be focusing on in terms of your projects, in terms of your research, in terms of enabling things. So that's all I have. Um, and then, you know, happy to take questions. But really, the, 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 the key areas I would talk about is foundation models. And, you know, there will be a multiplicity of models. There's some research to be done there. Um, the infrastructure, so we can actually reduce the cost by orders of magnitude, make it much more accessible. The kind of applications, you know, I talked about healthcare, I talked about software development, but contact centers, industrial manufacturing, uh, document processing, you know, all of these are going to get um, innovations. And then finally, education and training. Uh, there's actually a really interesting work that showed, this was done by BCG. So we did a work with Accenture that showed, you know, if you use generative AI, you become up to 50% more productive. 
BCG did similar work. They actually got similar results in terms of productivity. But one of the interesting uh, insights that came out of their research was that for beginners, the jump in productivity was much higher. Okay? And so think of it as if you are a new software engineer going to a company, you take a long time. In fact, you know, I was talking to Dean Brock about these, like, you know, we have this Amazon universities and all that, which is we are trying to get people up familiar with the infrastructure we have. And that's a long ramp up process. Imagine if things are getting automated, that becomes much easier. So it become, it's actually a great leveler in terms of how you upskill employees. Now, if generative AI is a great new tool for upskilling employees, ultimately a university's job is to upskill society. And so I think it's really important for universities, especially eminent universities like Yale, to think about what would upskilling society, upskilling students, 10 to 15 years from now look like? Okay, and the question and the thought that I would leave you with is if Yale were founded today, how would it be run? How would all of these technology be integrated into how you operate? Okay, that's all I have. Okay, thanks, thanks so much, President. Okay, oh, cool. we can, uh, I think. So <clears throat> I think a, a question to this last point that I would love to know is if you, so let's say we were designing this new version of Yale, and one of the first things we wanted to do was to teach kind of a flagship course called Generative AI for, I don't know, for undergraduates, for non-majors or something like that. What, what would be the elements you would include and how would you bring this kind of larger population into this sphere of I, what I think people are a little worried about may be kind of seen as exclusive in some way? How do, how do we bring everybody in? I think, so I would look at it from two aspects. One is a lot of content creation will be assisted by generative AI, right? And so let's say I am an artist. Um, or I am someone that is writing drafts. The first draft, a few years from now, will probably be created by a generative AI assistant. That then you improve. So the generative AI doesn't take away the role of the human. Generative AI, at least till now, doesn't have the creativity that a human has. But what it can get to is it can actually accelerate your work. And so previously, let's say you would have to create a draft and you're thinking a long time and you're writing it and you know, you're spending weeks over it, it can probably accelerate it to a couple of hours. And so that notion of, and that applies as much to the non-engineering parts of it. There's a lot of creative uh, output happening there. And so the things that I would look at is how do you use it as an assistant in a daily work? How do you, try to maybe automate some of the tedious work that you do? And how do you make sure that people outside of engineering, outside of computer science, are aware of these tools and are thinking about how to integrate that into the daily lives? Right? The way I look at it almost is, this is like the emergence of the internet. And today, everybody outside of CS and engineering uses email. Like, you know, email has become a natural way of doing work. You know, messaging and all this has become a natural way of doing work. Um, and so how do you integrate these technologies into your way of working? The difference with previous technologies, the difference with prior technical changes is that prior technical changes were not a creative assistant, right? This is the thing that can get integrated into the creative workflow. And that is where I think we would also look to universities to help us understand how these should get integrated. So like the uh, emergence of the calculator, there was a lot of anxiety about how this is going to change the way we think about education. The calculator has the virtue that 
it predictably gives you the correct answer. So <laughs> there's, uh, there's a funny phenomenon you mentioned, which is a, you know, AI hallucination. Are we, and, and I think it, those of us in science and engineering are, are kind of particularly uh, unnerved by this. So you, you ask generative AI a question that has to do with a research topic, and sometimes it just gives you the wrong answer. So bogus answers, yeah. <laughs> and so, it gives, sometimes gives you that answer in a very expert-like way. <laughs> exactly. It sounds like the right answer. Uh, to, what's your sort of response to that in terms of what you're seeing in the research front? Can we ameliorate that? Can we think about it in a way that makes it sort of seem like more of a bona fide research tool for serious engineering? Yeah. So I think there's a lot of research going on in how you deal with that and how you mitigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are techniques like RAG, retrieval augmented generation, um, that reduce it to a large extent. Some of the grounding things that say, okay, I generated it, but I got it from here. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an accelerator. You look at the output, you don't completely rely on it, but you can quickly check it, right? So I think those are there. And I think there's a lot of research to be done. This, I think, is a really good area for fundamental research. Um, and especially, I think, even to a large extent, these neural nets are still not fully understood how these are operating. And I think that's a great area for university research. So in terms of where you, you mentioned sort of great institutions like Yale, of course, we're all big fans of Yale, but where do you see our comparative advantage in this space in terms of preparing students to enter this kind of new, I mean, really novel, transformed work, workforce? I think there are a couple of aspects. One is um, Yale, has, Yale has some of the best research and teaching and, and professors across a variety of fields. And a lot of this, AI to healthcare requires collaboration between, you know, people who know medicine deeply and people who know computer science deeply and people who know engineering deeply because, you know, you have doing these sensors and so on. Uh, there's a lot of implications on society and public policy, you know. Um, one of the examples that I would love to see and, you know, we would love to collaborate on that is there are customers who say, you know, I have all kinds of legal contracts that I sign with everyone. <coughs> Can you quickly, if I upload three or four of these legal contracts, can you quickly tell me if there are conflicting portions in there, right? And so an interaction with, you know, the law school and someone from the computer science department would be great. You know, public policy is ripe for this. So I think one of the things that Yale can really do is that interdisciplinary portion. And then the second part, which I think a university like Yale um, can do, that is probably generally true of a lot of universities, but I think more true of Yale, because Yale has this really strong theoretical foundations to everything that it has done, is really furthering the understanding at a theoretical basic level of what is going on with some of these neural nets. And you know, as you were saying, Dean Brock, I think there's a lot of need to get into the system side because when you get into the system side, you're truly impacting society and shipping products. But I think without losing that core theoretical strength, because someone has to do that for us to really truly understand these systems. Yeah. All right, well, very good. I think I've exhausted my short list of questions, but I, I know there must be many in the audience. Is there anyone who Okay, and your first hand up in the front row here. <laughs> oh, here comes the Oh, mic. perfect. Hi, my name is Neil Sachdeva. I'm a, an undergrad studying computer science. Uh, I actually, I interned at AWS this past summer in Santa okay. Clara. Okay. Um, so good to meet you as, as my you. boss. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my question, which I got asked by family and friends for the past few months, was where is AWS in the conversation of, you know, where is AWS's chat GPT? So maybe you could discuss, and you mentioned in your roadmap earlier, uh, just highlight some of AWS's strengths in that moving forward. I think our key strength is making systems fit for enterprise usage, right? Now, I won't say it's easy, but it's one thing to get something out that a lot of consumers can use. 
But when you're thinking of an, about an enterprise setting, you really have a very different bar in terms of robustness, in terms of accuracy, and so on and so forth, right? And so now you're seeing, I'll give you an example. Think of Code Whisperer that I talked about. You can, and other companies have, come out with tools of, here is how you use generative AI for software. We came out with Code Whisperer, and a lot of our time was spent in putting accurate license attributions. So what you do is when you're generating code, you have to make sure it does not, is not a copy paste of somebody else's code. And if that somebody else's code has a proper license, you got to be able to generate code that has that copyright attribute. We were the first to come out with here is software development and here is the appropriate license for it, right? And if you don't have that, you can use that for research projects or just fun hackathons. You cannot use that in industry. So our core thing is how do you make these appropriate and suitable for industry? And that, I think, is a core strength. That is the place we innovate. That's great. It applies to scientific research as well, where you need appropriate citations yes. across the space. Sorry, next question. Yes, thank you, Brian, for an amazing talk. Um, I'm Sam Hayek. I'm a fellow in one of the Yale colleges. Um, five, ten years from now, um, how, Amazon will need to differentiate its AI products um, to compete with, you know, let's say the Microsofts and the other competitors. Um, and one way, obviously, is to make the products, you know, um, user-friendly and so on and so forth. I'm concerned about the, not for Amazon itself, but all the players, about the integrity of the fundamental uh, uh, data. Um, could you give us examples of how you, um, how you ensure integrity? Um, you know, very simply, make sure that let's say the image, one of the images that you're feeding into the ML system is not uh, corrupt and is not giving the, the wrong results. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because that's something that's top of mind for us, you know. And integrity, security, privacy, this is just foundational to everything we do, not just AI and ML. And, you know, we have whole teams that are focused on that. So we have a lot of mechanisms for that. One of the things that pretty much every service does is, and we do in the, in the AI space, is end-to-end -end encryption of everything. So you have encryption at rest, encryption in transit with customer-provided keys. Okay, so there's just no way um, anyone can do, um, anyone can kind of access that data. Um, there are a bunch of other mechanisms we use in terms of ensuring privacy of the data. And, uh, you know, we will also be coming up with some innovations now that actually reuse or use some of the latest signs in terms of um, how you do that. So this is, you know, this is pretty fundamental to everything we are building. Uh, one of the other things I'll also mention that a lot of customers are doing with generative AI is they're saying, look, I have, I mean, it could be Yale, it could be a company. Um, I'll give you an example. So, for example, we have a pharma company, let's say that wants to use this uh, generative AI and enable its chemists. And the way it wants to enable its chemists is they want to be able to go in and say, hey, give me all of the experiments that this company has run in the last 10 years about the side effects of this drug. And today you have to run a lot of searches. And now with, you can imagine with generative AI, it can just find it out. But the issue is that that data is not public, okay? Only that company has it. And so you need to be able to customize those models with your own data, right? Now, the way we do it kind of, you know, answers the previous question is pretty unique. The way we do it is when you customize the model, want to customize the model, we actually create your own private copy of the model. And then we create it in your own virtual private cloud. Okay, so it's in your own security domain. So we have a lot of these mechanisms that we are using to en ensure the security of the data. Good, yeah, next. Hi, I'm Ben Dernier. I'm an international student in uh, Yale College. 
I would like to ask you which in industries are least likely to be affected by AI, um, in your opinion, because there is like a debate on like which occupations, um, which, which industries, which jobs are least likely to be affected in your personal opinion in the long term by AI developers. You know, this I think is a fundamental innovation that ultimately will touch every aspect of what we do. Right. Um, and the way I look at it is it will generate so much new stuff. Net net technology has been, at least in my view, net net technology has been a, a positive force for society, as a positive force for humanity. We have become more productive, you know, we do a lot more. And I think this is yet another of those transformational technologies that will do the same. And I suspect, just like the internet, just like some of the key technical parts, it's going to be integrated into everything we do. You know, ultimately we humans create, right? Ultimately we do some form of creation. And this, I think, will be an assistant in that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, Office of Development, you mentioned using AI to have uh, help with interactions between patients and doctors. I was wondering if you foresee any unique roadblocks with medicine, with privacy concerns, or you know, HIPAA, anything like that that may make it uh, more difficult to be incorporated. So you know, the things that I mentioned were all HIPAA compliant. Um, I think in medicine you obviously have a much higher bar because you know you don't want it in in situations where the errors could be in there so the bar there will be higher and probably at least initially it will be a lot more of an assistant functionality where there's always a human in the loop that is doing the checking or the verification so let's say instead of a human creating the whole thing that took them an hour It'll probably be a human verifying the output and doing edits as needed that takes them 10 minutes. So it's really going to be a f productivity enhancer rather than a replacer. Nice. Hi, I'm Michael Cohen. I'm a public citizen here. And uh, there was an old expression in computing garbage in, garbage out. If you look at the data that's out there, there's a lot of garbage out there. How do you tell the difference between like Newsmax and the New York Times? Yeah. Um, so there is a huge, you know, there is, a, and I didn't go into that. There is a lot of engineering work we put in, but there's a lot of science as well. And there's actually two parts to this. So when we train our models, we have an entire team that is curating the data. So that's curating the data not just for the kind of content, but also for things like bias and toxicity and so on. So you don't want to train the model with inappropriate data of all kinds, right? So that's one aspect of it. Um, and we have huge teams that are working on that, like, you know, lots of people whose real job, whose job solely is to just, not just collect the data, but verify it, okay? But I also think there's a lot of research to be done. Now, there's a second aspect of that, which is how do you use the minimum amount of data to get the desired outcome, right? So there is a lot of work that shows that if you had a better way of curating your data, you might be able to get to the same result with fewer training cycles. So there's work to be done there. And I think there's work to be done. There's a lot of research to be done and how do you more efficiently curate these data sources? So today, it's a pretty, not a pretty, it's a very labor intensive effort. And that in many situations is when we are training these large language models, in many situations, that data collection and curation and filtering effort is actually the larger bottleneck. That's another good role for discerning you know, undergraduates yes. to play in this business. Um, so we have time for one more question. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Ursula. I'm also a computer science student here. I was wondering if you had any um, things that were top of mind relating to the intersection um, of cybersecurity and generative AI, and is there something that you think Amazon should be working on that um, they aren't uh, pursuing at the moment? Oh, so you know, I won't talk about all our roadmap stuff, and you know, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of work we are doing that you know will bring out um, in the course of time. I think generative AI and cybersecurity, um, cybersecurity I think will get a lot more interesting with generative AI in two different ways. One is, you know, bad actors can use generative AI to create more of these threats. Okay, more, um, you know, more threats that compromise systems. And so there's that aspect where they now have a new set of tools. Now there's the other aspect of it, which is you can use AI in general and generative AI also to be monitoring systems and to be raising the barriers to uh, people getting in. So I think there's both aspects of it. And I think there's work to be done, including a lot of very interesting research to be done at the intersection of the two. And you know, I suspect, um, I suspect there's a lot of very interesting research to be done there. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our guests, Pratt and Saha, once again for coming. And uh, I'd also like to thank our team for helping us put this together and Sai City for hosting us. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to run these here. So thanks very much once thank again, you, Dean sir. Thank you, Dean Grove.